Um, we are being joined by Sir Charles Gray and Victor Greenberg, who are going to speak one after the other. There will be a chance for questions after each individual speaker, and then we'll have some more questions at the end if there are any more, which I'm sure there will be. Um, first, Charles is going to speak to us. Um, Sir Charles Gray was a media barrister and then a High Court judge who presided over the David Irving libel lawsuit against Deborah Livstadt for calling him a Holocaust denier. And he's going to be talking to us about the trial today. So, Charles, thank you very much. Thanks. Well, I'm very grateful to be invited to uh, talk to you, and I've been told I mustn't be more than 20 minutes, so I shall uh, try and ensure that I keep to that. It's rather a humbling experience um, talking to you. Uh, this evening, not least because Victor is beside me and he underwent the experiences which none of us have. We've discussed who should go first and we think it might be better if I go first because I'm going to perhaps or almost set the background for Victor when he comes to speak to you. Uh, my qualification for coming this evening is, as the President indicated to you, that I was the judge in the Irving case, which you may have heard about. Uh, and from the 11th of January to the 15th of March, which if you think about it, is quite a long time, in the Royal Courts of Justice in London, I presided over the trial of a libel action. And the libel action was brought, oddly enough, by David Irving, not by the defendants, who were Lipstadt, an American professor, and Penguin Books. They were the defendants in the case. Uh, and what Mr. Irving, David Irving, and I'll call him Irving from time to time if I may, uh, claimed to be libelous of him was a book entitled Denying the Holocaust, The Growing Assault on Truth and Memory. And the core issue which I had to decide was whether Irving should be awarded damages for libel, that was what he was asking for. Um, he said that the book that Lipstadt had written <coughs> accused him of a Nazi apologist, an admirer of Hitler, uh, and accused him also of distorting the historical record uh, in support of his contention that this did not take place. Uh, Lipstadt and Penguin in the libel action broadly accepted that that was the, what the book was saying about Irving, that they advanced what's called by lawyers a plea of justification, that's to say they were saying it was substantially true to allege that indeed Irving had uh, denied that the Holocaust took place uh, and had persistently dis distorted the historical record so as to place Hitler in a favourable light. And that was what the defendants effectively had to prove in this long trial. I'm not going to have to start again, I hope. Am I? <laughs> Um, it's a curious thing, but um, from time to time courts do find themselves having to decide important historical events. Um, I'm going to give just a couple of examples, if I may. One was a case called Daring and Uris. Dr. Daring had been a doctor at Auschwitz. Uh, and Uris, you've probably heard of Uris, he wrote several books, uh, inclu including uh, one called Exodus. And the accusation that he made against Dr. Daring was that he had carried out experimental operations on inmates at Auschwitz uh, without um, administering any, any as, uh, anaesthetic. And it was said in the book that there were thousands of people on whom he'd operated. Well, evidence was called by people on behalf of uh, uh, Uris and on behalf of Dr. Daring. And at the end of the day, the jury, it was a jury action, decided that uh, Dr. Daring had carried out experimental operations on inmates at Auschwitz, but that it wasn't true to say that there had been thousands of those operations, nor was it true to say that he hadn't administered anaesthetics. Nevertheless, the jury took a very dim view of Dr. Daring, and they awarded him what was then the smallest coin in the realm, which was not half a P, but half a D. You're too young to remember that, but there was a, a pence in the old-fashioned sense. It was the smallest coin in the realm, and it was a derisory award of damages. So that was one of the cases, one of the uh, historical cases about World War II. And there was another one, and it was a case, another libel action, brought by a man called Lord Aldington, 
against somebody called Count Tolstoy, of whom you may have heard. Tolstoy had published a pamphlet in which he accused Aldington of being responsible for the massacre of 70,000 Cossacks and Yugoslavs, men, women, and children, uh, in 1945. I wasn't the... that case. Uh, it took place in 1989, but I was counsel for Lord Aldington. Uh, and very briefly, I'm not going to go into the details of it, he was a, a brigadier, a young brigadier in a division of the British Army which had fought its way up Italy. Uh, and uh, when they got to Austria, they were seething with people of all sorts of na nationalities. Um, the case involved looking at an enormous number of contemporaneous documents, uh, military documents, situation reports, all that kind. Um, we had a jury in that case as well, the case took place in 1989. They rejected uh, Tolstoy's defense um, that the libel was justified. They were satisfied that Aldington had not been involved in repatriating any of the Cossacks, and moreover, uh, that he had had no idea that the Yugoslavs were going to meet the ghastly face, fate that they did when they were returned to uh, Yugoslavia. Um, Toby Aldington was awarded 1.5 million pounds in damages. He never received a penny, but that was, and still is, uh, the largest sum ever awarded in a libel action in England. Now, juries decided those two actions, as I've told you. In the Irving case, I sat without a jury. It was regarded as being an impossible case to try with a jury. And it was a rather daunting and lonely task, being the judge. Um, it's, it's right to pose the question whether a judge is a right person to decide history, to decide what did and didn't happen. <clears throat> Nearly 65 years ago, 65 or 66 years ago. Now, it's perfectly true that judges do have to decide conflicts between experts of one kind and another. For example, they may have to decide whether a, a patent is a, a novel invention in a, a highly technical uh, sense, or they may have to decide complicated medical issues in negligence actions and so on. Um, but I was a lawyer, and am still a lawyer, not a historian, so who was I to uh, try and decide what had happened or hadn't happened so many years ago in Germany? Um, I said um, this in my uh, judgment, um, I'm quoting, it's important to stress at the outset, I don't regard as being any of my function as the trial judge to make findings of fact about what uh, did and what did not happen during the Nazi regime in Germ Germany. Well, that was a kind of self-denying ordinance, but it was an extremely difficult one to um, observe and, and honor when it came to giving judgment. The buck stopped with me in the sense that I was the final arbiter. Uh, but it was very difficult for me to s avoid making factual findings uh, about what did and didn't happen. How can you decide whether someone, in this case Irving, distorted history without making a finding as to what the history actually was? Um, I was very much helped by um, having... Uh, extremely good experts giving evidence before me. Professor Richard Evans, who some of you may have come across, he's a professor of modern history now at this university, uh, and uh, another Canadian professor, Van Pelt, he was called Van der Pelt. Uh, he had an encyclopedic uh, knowledge of Auschwitz, which I'm going to come to in, in a moment, uh, and uh, he gave evidence uh, on the, the topic, the main topic of the libel action which is whether it was true that millions of Jews met their deaths in the gas chambers at Auschwitz. Um, it has to be said um, that David Irving uh, was, as I said in my judgment, a military historian of considerable skill, good researcher, uh, very fluent on his feet as well, uh, and he conducted his own case and conducted it with considerable, as I thought, skill. I had to decide a host of what were essentially historical questions. Um, it, it, it would take far too long if I were to list all of them, but can I just give you some examples? And so, some of them may ring a, a bell. I don't know whether you have studied um, Nazi history. The events of Kristallnacht, that was the night of the broken glass, when for the first time there was wide-scale 
uh, destruction of Jewish property and Jewish synagogues in Germany. Uh, there was the expulsion and subsequent shooting uh, of uh, a number of Jews who uh, were transported from Berlin in 1941. There was the so-called Schlegenberger note, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment if I may, about the timing of the final solution. There was the Wannsee conference, which I expect some of you would have heard of, uh, when there was a discussion uh, or alleged to be a discussion uh, about uh, what was intended to happen to the Jews but it was couched in such euphemistic terms that Mr Irving was able to argue that it wasn't actually referring to the Jews at all. So my task was to decide whether in relation to those and a host of other events what um, David Irving had written in his various books was a distortion or whether it wasn't. Let me just elaborate a little bit on the sort of exercise that I had to embark on. I'm going to give you a couple of examples, if I may. The background to the first one is that there were, in 1941, still living in Berlin, about 146,000 Jews. About seven, sorry, 146,000 Jews still living in Germany, of which about 76,000 lived in Berlin. On the 30th of November 1941, Himmler, name which I'm sure will be familiar to you all, wrote a note to Heydrich, also a familiar villain, uh, which read, and uh, if I may give you the German and then we'll break it down, Juden transport aus Berlin, keine liquidierung. Now the defendants in, that was my, my um, um, Professor Lipstadt, um, and Penguin Books were highly critical of the way David Irving treated that particular message which had to be analysed in great detail uh, in his um, various books. Um, what they said was uh, that there was absolutely no reason to suppose that Hitler had anything to do with the note whereas Irving had said that this reflected an instruction that he had given to, to Himmler about what was to happen to the Jews. Moreover, Irving accepted uh, in cross-examination that he quite misrepresented Hitler's order because he uh, took it to be uh, a general order as to what was to be done with Jews in 1941. But I read the words, Judentransport aus Berlin, that's a singular noun, it's just one transport, and it's a transport from Berlin. Uh, and it was just that transport which was not going to be liquid, liquidated, kind of liquidarum. It wasn't a general instruction. So um, that was the sort of exercise that was involved in, in that was required of me uh, when dealing with that particular single document dating back to 1941. Let me give you one more example uh, of another issue that arose at the trial. It related to the Schlegenberger note. That was a curious document on which Mr. Irving placed considerable reliance in support of his case, which was that Hitler cons consistently intervened to mitigate the harm sought to be done by other senior Nazi officials to the Jews. Now, the, the author of that note was indeed a, a, a Herr Schlegelberger, who was an official in the Ministry of Justice, not a particularly senior one. The note's not dated, and it's not signed. It purports to record what Mr. Schlegelberger had been told by another official in the ministry. So it was, as lawyers call it, hearsay. Namely, that Hitler had told him that he wanted the Jewish question postponed until after uh, the war. In other words, the final solution, finish the war and then deal with, get on with the final solution to what was called the Jewish question. I, I'm not going to recite all the arguments that took place. I'm trying to give you an idea of the sort of problems that arose during the trial. There were a great many arguments advanced in relation to this one document. But the conclusion that I arrived at was that this was not the diamond document which Mr. Irving claimed, uh, and that his use of the document could not be uh, objectively justified for the reasons that I've sought to explain.
Um, now, the expert witnesses uh, instructed on behalf of the defendants in the case <coughs> accumulated what appeared to me to be an impressive catalogue of other historical events in relation to each of which I found, I had to find, um, that um, Irving had continually downplayed uh, Hitler's anti-Semitism and sought wrongly to distance Hitler from the awful fate which had met so, uh, with, with which so many um, Jews had been uh, landed. Uh, I took the view that Irving's historiography uh, seriously misrepresented what had happened. But amidst all the horrors of war, it is the mass extermination of Jews um, by the Nazis at numerous death camps, but particularly Auschwitz, uh, which arouses the greatest revulsion. Uh, Auschwitz, I think, without question, was the most terrible of the camps. Um, Victor will be able to describe uh, his experiences there in a moment. Professor Van Pelt said Auschwitz was, and I'm quoting, the pivot of Holocaust denial and the largest of the so-called extermination camps. And so it, the, what did or did not happen at Auschwitz assumed great importance at the trial of the, uh, the libel action. Lipstadt, as I've indicated, had described Irving as a Holocaust denier. That's become a very familiar phrase uh, nowadays. Uh, a major section of my judgment was devoted to the question whether that description of Irving by her was justified. It was something the defendants had to justify by evidence. Um, did Irving deny that the Holocaust had happened? Um, and if he had denied it, I had to decide whether that denial was false. In other words, did what Irving say didn't happen <coughs> at Auschwitz really happen, as Professor Lipstadt was contending? Now, Irving accepted that Hitler had been an deeply anti-Semitic from the very early days. And as you all know, Hitler was born in Austria, uh, and anti-Semitism almost appears to have originated, I think it's fair to say, in, in Austria. Uh, I don't know whether you've read a recent book uh, called The Hair with the Amber Eyes by uh, Edmund de Waal, and he gives a vivid account of uh, the experiences that Jews went through, particularly in Vienna, but I think throughout Austria, uh, how they were persecuted, discriminated against, deported in some cases to Dachau, uh, and expropriated. Um, and it's perhaps noteworthy that Hitler, by then the Chancellor of Germany, was present in Vienna on the 9th of April 1938, when Goebbels proclaimed the day of the greater German Reich. Now what um, David Irving uh, contended was that as the war got more difficult from the German point of view, Hitler simply lost interest in the anti-Semitic crusade, which he'd undoubtedly associated himself with to begin with. Um, the defendants called two experts, Dr. Peter Longerich and Professor Christopher Browning, uh, to the effect that um, Hitler both knew about and approved of the killing of Jews on a massive scale, both on the Eastern Front in Poland and the other countries to the east of uh, Germany, uh, as well as in concentration camps uh, across Europe. Uh, uh, an odd feature of the case was that Irving's position uh, in relation to the killing of Jews appeared to shift as the trial progressed. He eventually did accept that there had been Jews ex executed on, on uh, uh, a massive scale by Einsatzgruppen, that's groups of soldiers um, formed by the SS uh, in the East. Uh, and Hitler uh, was uh, accepted by uh, Irving to have known about and approve of those killings. But some might say that the extermination of Jews by killing, uh, by shooting, is one thing, but exterminating Jews by gassing is quite another. When he opened the case to, for the defendants, uh, the barrister representing them, Richard Rampton, Queen's Counsel, quoted a, a couple of remarks that Irving had made about nine years before the libel action. The first was this, I don't see any reason to be tasteful about Auschwitz. It's baloney, 
It's a legend. And then in another uh, lecture, Irving had said this, I say quite tastelessly that more people died on the back seat of Edward Kennedy's car in Chappaquiddick than ever died in a gas chamber in Auschwitz. Well, tasteless is the word. But this had not always been Irving's position in relation to Auschwitz. In the 1977 edition of a book of his called Hitler's War, Irving had unequivocally accepted as a historical fact that there had been systematic mass murder of Jews in purpose-built extermination camps. But by the time the 1991 edition of that same book appeared, Irving had done a 180 degree turn and was saying no, there was no extermination of Jews by gassing uh, at Auschwitz. Now, what caused the dramatic uh, <coughs> change of heart? Well, the answer is uh, a man called Fred Leuchter, a rather shadowy figure who'd uh, spent some time advising penitentiaries in America uh, about gas chamber executions. Um, Irving had, uh, Leuchter was one witness, and Irving was another for a man called Ernest Zundler, Zundel, who was tried in Canada, in effect, for denying the existence of gas chambers at Auschwitz. And it was Leuchter's report which caused Irving to change his mind. In the following years, having read the Leuchter report, Irving said again and again that no serious historian could believe that Auschwitz was a Todesfabrika, that means a death factory. But when Irving came to give evidence at the trial of his action against Lipstadt in 2000, he agreed that the Leuchter report was fundamentally flawed as Professor Pelt, van der Pelt, had uh, testified in his report. The argument uh, centered on a building in Auschwitz called Crematorium II. Uh, it was Lipstadt's case that it was in that crematorium that over 500,000 Jewish men, women, and children had been killed by gassing. Leuchter's report said that he had tested the cyanide residues in the inner walls of crematorium two to see what the concentration of cyanide was there. Cyanide was what the way in which the gas was administered. He found that it was slight compared with the concentrations of cyanide in the different crematoria where delousing of clothing and so on took place. Leuchter triumphantly declared on the basis of that finding uh, that this proved that crematorium too had not been used for gassing people. But what Leuchter had done was to make a rather elementary mistake. He'd assumed that the concentration of cyanide required to kill humans was greater than the level of cyanide required for delousing. The truth is, as Leuchter and Irving finally accepted, that you need 22 times more cyanide to delouse clothing than you do to kill humans. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Evans, Professor Evans, the uh, witness for the expert witness for um, the defendants, described Leuchter's evidence as being crass, so it was. And Irving himself had to accept uh, that in this and other respects, the Leuchter report was fundamentally flawed. Um, other points taken by Leuchter in his report were that there weren't windows in the, in the crematorium 2 through which initially cyanide gas but later on Zyklon B uh, tablets containing cyanide would have been fed into the chamber below uh, and that there weren't chimneys which would have been needed in order to release the gas that had been put into the crematorium. Uh, Irving adopted these arguments of uh, Leuchter at a rather late stage in the case. Um, and I did accept in my judgment that there were architectural drawings of Auschwitz, which were found when um, Auschwitz was um, liberated, if that's the right word, by the Russians in 1945, which did not show chimneys. It's pretty easy to imagine why they might not have shown chimneys, because people might have asked questions what the chimneys were for. Anyway, the, um, 
overall conclusion that I arrived at in relation to this important issue, and I'm going to quote, if I may, from um, just one paragraph <coughs> of the uh, judgment. I dealt with, the, with the, the various arguments advanced in relation to the point that um, Irving made a lot of, namely that there didn't appear to be any holes in the roof. The roofs at Auschwitz, many of you may have been there, has collapsed, but you can still see it. You can see where it would have been. And there's no sign of any, so Irving said, no sign of any um, holes for the chimneys in the roof. And what I said was this, the roof is in a bad state, so it's hard to tell if there were holes in it. There's a possibility that the holes were backfilled. There's the evidence of eyewitnesses who observed or at least described pellets being poured down through the roof of the morgue. Uh, the drawing by a man of, called O'Leary, or O'Leary, depicts clearly the chimneys running up towards the roof of the gas chamber. And I said that that appearance uh, corresponded with some photographs taken. Uh, so I concluded that an objective historian taking account of all the evidence would conclude that the apparent absence of evidence of holes in the roof of the morgue, a crematorium too, falls far short of being a good reason for rejecting the cumulative effect of the evidence on which the defendants uh, rely. There was another grisly argument, and I apologize for talking about these things, but one's got to face the awfulness of what happened. Another point that took was taken by David Irving um, was um, in relation to the uh, was in relation to the amount of coke which would have been required to burn the bodies of the people who had been gassed. His argument was that 35 kilos would have been required. That would have been the minimum amount of the coke required to burn a single corpse. Um, he got that figure of 35 kilos from another concentration camp, which is where apparently that was the position. Uh, he, Irving, uh, maintained that it wouldn't have been possible to supply and store at Auschwitz uh, the uh, quantities of coke which would have been necessary to incinerate corpses uh, at the rate indicated in contemporaneous documents. Uh, but Professor Van Pelt, Van der Pelt, again disposed of that argument by pointing out uh, that if many bodies are burned together and if the incinerators operated continuously rather than being swept, switched off from time to time, the amount of uh, coke required uh, was no more than 3.5 kilos. So what I had to, under, to stand back really and do was to look at the totality of the evidence bearing on this question of extermination in the, by gassing in, in a particular crematorium too, but elsewhere in Auschwitz as well. And I accepted that there was a convergence of evidence consisting of the eyewitnesses, the scientific um, evidence and so on, that hundreds of thousands of Jews were systematically gassed to death at Auschwitz by the use of cyanide gas and later cyanide uh, pellets. Uh, the number of Jews gassed was estimated by Professor van der Pelt, who's a great expert on Auschwitz, um, at uh, a total of 865,000 people. So I've tried to give you, and I hope I haven't taken too long over it, a flavor of some of the issues that were debated. Um, the inhumanity and degradation are impossible to comprehend or explain, but it was necessary to consider the arguments with care um, because they were of obvious importance. Um, the hearing of the evidence in the Irving trial lasted for about two months. Closing speeches took place on 15th of March. The trial took place in Court 37 at the Royal Courts of Justice. If any of you have ever visited it, um, that is the biggest court by far. Every seat was taken every day through this long trial. And indeed, there were queues outside uh, the court door, and many had to be turned away. It was obviously a somber trial. Most trials have a few lighter moments. Uh, this really didn't. Uh, the only events that I recall which might be described as being lighter uh, was one day I was told that the Israeli ambassador was going to come and listen to some evidence uh, 
uh, and he wanted to have permission to bring two armed officers with him into court. Did I agree to that? Much too important a question for me to decide. It had to go up high, and I know, don't know what the answer was. And there was another event which um, was rather sad in a way. Irving was normally scrupulously careful to obey all the conventions, although he was a litigant in person. He knew how to address people and so on. Uh, he knew that he was supposed to call me as the judge, my lord, but he made a terrible slip one day and he addressed me as mein Führer. Uh, <laughs> he was um, embarrassed, but it was in a way quite revealing, I thought. <laughs> the case was closely followed and reported by the press, not just in the United Kingdom, but all over the world. I mean, the obvious interest in it um, was striking. There was a lot of uh, ground to cover, uh, and I was daunted by the scale of the task. Uh, and the importance of the case, the questions that I had to decide. I gave judgment on the 11th of April 2000. I remember being told by the usher that Irving had asked that a message be sent to me um, in advance, apologizing for his appearance. So I said, what's the problem? And apparently he'd been pelted with eggs on his way into court. And some of you may have seen the photograph of him rather bizarrely dressed in a waistcoat and without a jacket because of the eggs having covered it. The judgment was necessarily, well I say necessarily, but it was very long and detailed. I think it had to be. Um, can I just read, if I may, the overall conclusion right at the very end. The question which I have to ask myself is whether, is whether the consequence of the defendant's failure to prove the truth of these matters, there were some matters they failed to prove in my judgment, uh, I then went on to say this. The failure on the part of the defendants to prove the truth of those charges materially injures the reputation of Irving in view of the fact that the other defamatory charges made against him have been proved to be justified. The charges which I've been found to be substantially true include the charges that Irving has for his own ideological reasons persistently and deliberately misrepresented and manipulated historical evidence that for the same reasons he's portrayed Hitler in an unwarrantedly favorable light, principally in relation to his attitude towards and responsibility for the treatment of Jews, and that he is an active Holocaust denier, that he is anti-Semitic and racist, and that he associates with right-wing extremists who promote neo-Nazism. Uh, so it was a, a, a clear result uh, in favor of Professor Lipstadt and Penguin Books. Um, it was highly publicized. It was a f the lead story on the front pages of all the, uh, the broadsheets. Uh, Penguin Books, I say, were one of the defendants. They decided to publish my judgment in this little book, which I've been quoting from from time to time. Irving appealed the judgment, but the appeal was uh, dismissed. The Russian army, as I mentioned, liberated Auschwitz uh, in uh, 1945. Um, few of those who survived Auschwitz, and I'm very happy to say Victor is one of the, the few, uh, are still alive. Um, and we're very fortunate to have Victor here present this evening. The awful events which uh, I've described took place a long time ago, but I'm sure you will agree with me that we mustn't forget them. We're all familiar with the Remembrance Day words, lest we forget. Tomorrow is, of course, Holocaust Memorial uh, Day. The Holocaust, I think, is a prime example of man's inhumanity to man. Uh, and the sad fact that there are so many regions in the world where such inhumanity continues. And it mustn't, wherever it's happening. Thank you very much. straight to Victor and then we'll take questions in the end if that's okay. Um, I'm not going to give Victor much of an introduction except to say that um, he is, so his town was, um, the population of his town was massacred in 1941 and he escaped only to end up in Auschwitz and um, <coughs> obviously he survived that experience and he's going to be sharing his personal story with us today so Mr. Greenberg thank you very much for joining us. <coughs>
Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. Welcome. It's encouraging to see a good attendance. It's not a cheerful subject that I'm talking about, but I welcome the opportunity to speak because I feel it's important that you know what happened and that you pass it on to future generations. <clears throat> I'll speak about my background, where I came from, type of environment and life we led when I was a boy, the occupation of that area by the Hungarians, the hostilities leading to the liquidation and the destruction of the Jewish communities in that area. You will then have the opportunity to ask questions. When we talk about the Holocaust, we speak about the greatest tragedy. There were many tragedies and atrocities committed over the centuries, and the Jews suffered more than any. But the Holocaust was unique. It was a policy by a powerful nation to exterminate all European Jewry. The Holocaust means the destruction of Jewish culture and heritage built over several hundred years in Europe, Eastern Europe, part of Russia, and this side as far as Greece and Corfu. Almost the destruction of all Jews in those areas. Not only did they die, they suffered humiliation, degradation, and were reduced to subhuman level. The decimation of the Jews in those areas was such that only four to five percent survived. I'll give you an example. Poland had the largest concentration of Jews in Europe. Three and a quarter million Jews lived in Poland before the Second World War. And there are now only about five, six thousand mainly old people. Every time a person is killed by accident or in war, it's a tragedy to the family. I'm talking about six million tragedies. <clears throat> I was born in a village called Maidan, and you won't find it on the map. One of the many clusters of villages in the Carpathian Mountains or Ruthenia bordering Hungary, Poland, Romania. It is now Ukraine. The nearest town was about 50 miles away. And the area was beautiful scenery, lovely mountains and rivers, but very primitive. The only industry there was timber. And there were no luxuries. People struggled to feed their large families. <clears throat> The area was governed by Czechoslovakia between the two world wars. There were two main communities in our village. There were 42 Jewish families and about 80 families Ukrainian Catholics, plus a few Czech families administrating the area. There was a reasonable coexistence. It suited both communities. The uh, Ukrainians mostly were farmers and some of the Jews were traders and they exchanged uh, farm produce for household goods and it seemed to work. <clears throat> I had a happy childhood. It was a close-knit Jewish community. There were two separate cultures as I said before and separate schools. The Czech school for the Jewish children and the few Czech families and the Ukrainian school for the Catholics. <clears throat> and also the Jewish schools, Jewish education was very important. Life revolved around the religion there. There was no television or discos in those days. It was similar to a film called Fiddler on the Roof. I don't know if you've seen it but similar atmosphere. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> Every morning, we as children had to get up to go to uh, what was called Cheder, a morning school, to learn Jewish studies. And then we went to Czech school. <clears throat> the rabbis ruled supreme. They settled disputes and they were respected. I was 10 years old when the war broke out in 1939. Soon after, the Hungarians occupied the area, and that's when the hostilities began. They introduced restrictions, anti-Semitism surfaced, and they amalgamated the two schools. <clears throat> Till then, we had separate cultures and schools. We had constant fights at schools, but we could never win because the teachers were anti-Semitic. The church had a big influence as well. I remember Easter and Christmas, when they came out of the church, they were throwing stones at Jewish homes and the synagogue. And this continued until the autumn of 1941, when the Hungarian army rounded up about 85% of the Jews and transported them to Poland, where they were all massacred. <clears throat> They left a few families to continue because they were useful to them. My father was supplying the local army with meat, so they needed him. And we continued under difficult conditions till the spring of 1944. And then they gave orders for the few Jews who were living in the area <clears throat> together outside the synagogue and we were then loaded up onto army lorries and transported to a ghetto which was near the town about 50 miles away. A ghetto is an area where you're restricted, you can't go out and conditions there were terrible because we, uh, we had about five, six families living in one house and there was very little food and uh, by that time the Gestapo had taken over and they appointed one man who was lo a local doctor to be the liaison officer between the Jewish community and the Gestapo and after a couple of days we heard that he committed suicide sadly uh, I can only imagine he found out what was in store for us and he couldn't take it. And we stayed in this ghetto for three weeks and then we were told to start marching towards the railway line and when we got the, the SS Gestapo very uh, terrible to us, they started hitting people and demanding everybody hand over all their valuables, not that people had very much, but some of the ladies uh, had wedding rings, so they had to hand them in. And eventually uh, we were then loaded up on what was termed as cattle trucks, packed in uh, as many as they could, and conditions there were dreadful. We didn't have any facilities to wash or uh, get any water or <coughs> get any food or uh, even no toilets and we uh, eventually started riding towards Auschwitz which took three days and three nights. By the time we got there a few people died, especially elderly, they couldn't take the uh, circumstances and when we arrived in Birkenau <coughs> Suddenly the doors opened and the assassins were standing outside shouting Raus, Raus, which means out. We were only too glad to get out and we were told to form a queue approaching the selection area where the Gestapo was sitting at the tables <coughs> and with a flick of a thumb they decided who was to live or die that day. As we were approaching there were some Jewish uh, youngsters working on the railways and one of them came up to me and he said how old are you? and I said 14 he says no 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 you're 18 I didn't take any notice and I was walking to near the selection another one came up to me and says don't forget tell them you're 18 and that saved my life because when we got there 
They asked me whether, how old I was, and I said 18, and that saved me. And on that day, I lost my mother, two younger brothers, one of 10 and 12, uncles and aunts, and their families, and almost all my friends. <coughs> I ended up in a camp which was called the Zigeuner Lager, which means the gypsy camp, because gypsies were also interned there, and they were in charge of us. And uh, conditions were dreadful. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, the worst thing was for me, I discovered that my father and two uncles were in the next camp. We were only divided by the electric barbed bar wire fences. And I used to meet them occasionally just to have a chat. And uh, the camp actually was a transit camp. They were selecting people to go from there to other camps to do work. But because my father and uncles were there, I didn't, never volunteered. And I stayed there uh, till the autumn of 1944. When my father told me once, he says, look, you've got to get out of the camp, you've got to volunteer, you've got to go out, because by that time the Russians were approaching and uh, the Gestapo were already murdering people in the gas chambers. He says, uh, so I decided <clears throat> to get out and when they were selecting people to go to another camp, of, they were forming queues of five and uh, I was still quite short, so I found um, a brick stone and I, and I went to the back of the queue, hoping that they'll select me to go to work. And I wasn't lucky. They picked me out and asked me how old I was, and I kept on saying 18. They said, no, you're not 18. You haven't even got hair. And, uh, and they started throwing me about from one another and asking how old I was. Anyway, I finished up being beaten up well, and, and then rejected to go to, and we were locked up in a barrack uh, to be taken to the gas chambers the next day. Luckily, my colleague and I had a close friend. We were very lucky, we managed to get out. They had narrow windows on top of the barracks and we managed to crawl out and that saved us. Well, so we went and then also joined the queue for the people who were leaving the camp to go to, our, to a working camp. But uh, those who were leaving already had tattooed numbers on their arms, which we didn't have. But nevertheless, we decided to take a chance and hopefully we'll get out. So as we were queuing there near the gates, <coughs> Uh, the assess uh, the, uh, had uh, several seats there deciding uh, who should go out or not. And as we were approaching, I said to my colleague, let's go to that one who looked a little bit rejected, he looked a little bit elderly. So we walked up to him and he, and he said, Numer, which was numbers, and just went. He says, Numer. So I said, we don't have one. So he looked us up and he let us go. He actually, an assessment saved our life. So we walked through the gates and as we were approaching the trains, I uh, noticed that my father was standing uh, there on uh, the, the other side of the barbed wires. And when he saw me, <coughs> He started crying and he walked away, and that's the last I've seen of him. Neither he nor my uncle survived. I can only imagine that by the time I left, they were so skinny, so thin like skeletons, that they probably died a natural death. Anyway, we were loaded up in, in, um, uh, onto the trucks again, and we were then taken to another camp in Austria called Mauthausen, which was also very similar. But uh, uh, we didn't do any work there either, and conditions were just dreadful. <clears throat> and after a time, 
as uh, the American forces were approaching, this was in Austria near Linz, uh, they decided to evacuate the camps and to take us to uh, other camps in, in a forest which was uh, quite a distance away. We managed to get there. Some of us who couldn't walk were actually killed uh, by the Gestapo. And uh, when we got there, and we had also uh, fences, barbed bar fences, but they were not electrified. Instead, they had guards guarding us at different intervals. <coughs> and the uh, conditions there were dreadful. We didn't have uh, hardly anything to eat at all. Uh, no, no water uh, to wash or, or anything. Uh, and uh, by that time, all of us were also very weak and the typhoid epidemic broke out and so within a couple of weeks almost all of them died from typhoid. I managed to survive. I, I, <coughs> I, I was also most of the time asleep but I woke up and I noticed there was a fire and a few of the inmates were roasting potatoes there and I couldn't believe it I thought I was in heaven or, or I'm dreaming so I walked up to them and I said what's going on here and they said don't you know we were liberated by the American forces and so my colleague and I uh, left the camp and we were <coughs> going around from one farm to another begging for food and uh, what happened that we both fell over with typhoid as well and I don't really know what happened but the next thing I remember waking up in a hospital in Linz, Linz. and uh, gradually I recovered but it took a long time I was really very weak I remember crawling to the toilet on my floor and, uh, and um, <coughs> but um, um, after a few weeks I recovered a bit of strength and then I decided to try and go back where I was born to see if there any of my family survived or friends and it took a long time but the Russian forces helped me a lot they were quite sympathetic towards us and when I got there I found my sister uh, survived and she was seven years older and also some cousins so we stayed in a village where my cousins used to live for a time, but the Russians were actually occupied that area, they were in charge. So after a few weeks we decided to leave because we didn't want to stay under Russian rule. And so we had to, to leave, we had to go across to Romania and uh, there were some Russian guards uh, over the, standing at the bridge which we had to cross to Romania and we came over and, and they didn't let us through. In fact, they, they locked us up in prison for a night. And then when we came out, I managed to find somebody who was a camp survivor and he said, the only way you would go across if you would bribe the guards. So what I had only one pair of shoes hanging on my shoulder. So we went over and I gave him the pair of shoes and they let us through. And that's how we got into Romania. And then, after a time, <clears throat> a couple of days, I gradually made my way back to Czechoslovakia and I found some cousins who lived in a town called Khomutov and I stayed there for a few months with them. And then an opportunity arose for me to come to Britain. What happened, a Jewish organization in, in England got permission from the uh, British government to bring over a thousand youngsters. They had to be under the age of 16. So they managed to find 732 altogether. And we came over at different transports. Uh, mine was the last one actually. And um, ours uh, landed in Northern Ireland. <coughs> so you can call me an Irishman if you like. I, I stayed there for a few months which was a blessing because we were in um, sort of barracks uh, on, uh, like a farm and we were uh, looked after by um, 
and Jewish people who, who came over just before the war started called the Kinder Transport. They were looking after us very well. We had enough to eat and we were slept very comfortable. We were doing quite a lot of sports and we gained a lot of strength back, which was a blessing. And then after a few months, <clears throat> they decided to uh, evacuate us and uh, we all came to England and um, went to, some of us went to different hostels and I stayed in a hostel in Golders Green <coughs> for some time and gradually uh, we started learning English and uh, some of us continued with their studies and some became very successful. We, we produced a couple of university professors, some dentists, some vets, and uh, uh, they did very well. And the rest of us started gradually working. And that's how we started um, uh, to um, make our life. <coughs> it took some time, uh, and eventually I ended up um, in the costume jewelry business and then I found a partner and we were running a manufacturing business and doing a lot of exports which was successful and made a very good living. And then I met my lovely wife who's sitting here and uh, we brought up a lovely family two sons and a daughter, they all went to university, they all had a very good education. And one is a lawyer, one is a, an accountant, and we've got nine grandchildren, so we were very lucky. <clears throat> and uh, I, I just wanted to tell you that... Sorry. Yeah, well, when we lived in the hostels, we also formed a, a youth club called, it was called the Primus Jewish Youth Club, which was very successful. And we, we uh, used it uh, as a second home, so to speak. We used to go there regularly and we do sports and we used to have even dancing lessons. And some of them became very successful in sports. We even produced uh, a, a, a weightlifting British champion who competed uh, in the Olympics even. And that was uh, very, very good because uh, we got very friendly and uh, it, it helped us a lot. It was like a family, you know, and it, it helped to build up our confidence. And gradually, as I said, we all started working. <clears throat> And um, I just want to finish up with this. Most people have a problem from time to time, be it at school or at home or working. And if you have problems, try to solve it. If you can't, put it aside and carry on with life. Life must carry on, so it's no good worrying about it. If you've got a problem, just leave it and continue. And with this, I'm going to finish. But I'm open to questions. If you've got any questions to ask, I'll be happy to answer.
do you credence to the legitimacy of the claim that it never happened? Or do you feel that that's sort of part of what a scholar of the debate should be? So then, do you think that um, talking to Holocaust, having debate with Holocaust deniers legitimizes what they say? Do they what? Make it um, seem like a valuable viewpoint. <coughs> I think it's very important that you know what happened and in most cases I gave quite a number of talks in the past. All the students were listening very carefully and and I think they really took it in and it will stay with them for some time, which is important also to pass it on to future generations. Can I also answer that question, if I may? Um, it's a good question, because what you're really saying is, why not let them get on with it? They're all a bit cranky. Is it going to do any harm? But I, I fear it does do harm. I think you've got to take these people on, because apart from anything else, there are an amazing number of Holocaust deniers. I mean, the amount of hate mail I got after that decision was quite extraordinary. There were a lot in Australia, I don't know why, Australia, Canada, <laughs> you name it. There are, and if you don't confront them, I mean, Irving was rather an exceptional case in a way, but if you don't confront them, they get away with it, and, and who knows, maybe it'll catch on, and more and more people will believe the deniers. So I think it was important to do it in that case. I'm glad that they did. <clears throat> Thank you very much to both of you. Uh, it's such a privilege to be able to uh, my question is that Auschwitz in particular, um, it may be the case for other um, camps, I don't know, but Auschwitz is falling down and it's in a very bad state. Um, do you think it should be preserved? And if so, if so who should be responsible for that? The, it's a good question and they are actually preserving it. They're doing some work now, which I read recently to try and preserve it, yeah, to keep it in good condition. Because the, the, bar the um, barracks were, were built of wood, you know, so you'd have to rebuild them, probably. Yeah. They're making a point of doing this. Can I, can I just add something? There was a time, I, well, I mean, this is very anecdotal, but I remember going to a concentration camp in Czechoslovakia, and this must have been in the 60s when it was still communist run. And the communists had turned it into a kind of an exhibition for the communist way of life and communism. And that seems to me to be such a sad perversion that I think one want, wants to conserve these places, but to conserve them in an honest way, not to turn them into sort of political footballs, which is the danger. No, no, I mean, you're right, I think it's going to be a bit of a gloomy evening, and we're talking about gloomy events, aren't we? Um, I, I d don't know the answer. I mean, I think it tends to be minorities that are persecuted, and you're right in saying it happens all over the world, notably, I think, in Africa. But what are we actually doing about it? Well, the answer is we have set up the International Criminal Court, but that doesn't... Oh, I'm doing something. Let's try that. But the International Criminal Court is not really working because we get these villains who are tried there. The trials go on for two or three years and they usually, or well, very often, seem to end in, in a rather unsatisfactory outcome. So, um, yes, you're right. It, it's happening more, I think, more and more in a way. And goodness knows what's going on in China, for example. Uh, and closer to home, let's face it. Um, but what one can do about it, I think, 
the law is not the answer. I mean, I think it's got to be education rather than retrospective punishment. And thank you very, very much for speaking. I just wanted to ask Sir Charles, um, if you were very conscious uh, during the trial of the historical significance um, of what was taking place in the legal battle between Holocaust and Maya and the historian, was that very conscious while the trial was taking place and then you were judging it? Uh, very much so. I mean, you could hardly fail to notice the importance, simply because of the number of people who were following the case very, very carefully, and also because of the reporting of it. I mean, it's, I've never been in a case where there was so much reporting of e events every day, although it was a very, in a way, arcane sort of case, a lot of expert evidence. Um, but I was personally very conscious that it was essential to get it right. And one mustn't jump to conclusions as to what the right answer was. I, I did have an open mind, and Irving was at times very persuasive. But in the end, it, there was an accumulation of evidence that convinced me that the answer was that he, 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 was, he was the one who was manipulating history, and, and it's not an invention of some sort. So uh, affirmative is the answer to the question. Yes, I will, uh, one, one hopes so. I think your typical Holocaust denier is a man who is, or a woman, who's completely closed his or her mind to the historical realities. But there may be people in the middle who are a bit skeptical, because there are skeptical people who, you know, but let's face it, there may be exaggerations going on, things like that. I think they may get convinced if somebody recounts what happened. I mean, anecdotal evidence is also very helpful. I mean, you've heard from somebody who went through these awful things, and we've tried to sort of give opposite perspectives on it, because I was doing it ex post facto in a sort of hopefully an analytical way. And th the combination just might, I suppose, convince people it did happen, and if they're convinced, it's less likely to happen again, one hopes. I'm sorry, I'm hard of hearing. She said, do you feel that your Jewish faith helped you during the Holocaust? And do you feel that since then you've been um, sufficiently apologised to? <clears throat> um, at, at the time when I was in the camps, all I was thinking about is survival from day to day. And we didn't practice any... Jew, uh, Jewish uh, religion or anything like that at all. There was no opportunity to do that. Um, and what was the other question? Sir? Do you feel that you've been uh, recompensed or apologised to? Have I been recompensed? Uh, one can't possibly apologise for what had happened, you know. But I'm also asked whether I hate the <coughs> Germans or the Austrians for what they did. Uh, I can tell you that I don't carry any hatred. None of us actually, because I'm, I've still got a group of survivors I'm friendly with, carry hatred. Because if you hate, you can't be happy. But having said that, we can't possibly forgive for what they did. And, uh, you know, apologies are not going to happen, not going to help. <coughs> I've known a number of survivors who said that it was difficult at the beginning to tell their stories, either for personal reasons or because they didn't feel that people wanted to hear. And it actually, factually, it was only in the 1960s that it began to be quite common to 
I don't know what your experience was. I'd actually be quite interested to know uh, at what point you felt you could take your life at all. But also, do you feel that even today it's quite difficult and that you, do you feel confident that there's enough interest in what happened? Or do you feel that there's also some resistance or some difference? Uh, I actually started talking about this um, quite early on, uh, but uh, a lot of uh, our group are not prepared to speak about it. They can't take this strain. And um, because I started a long time ago, for me it's quite easy, you know, I just go through it. Um, and what was the other thing? Do you feel that today there's enough interest, or do you think some people are indifferent or even resistant? Well, from, from my experience, I think that people are interested to know what, what happened. And they take uh, good notice, yeah. And, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, they, they take a big interest to find out exactly what happened, yeah. Can, can I just add something? Because I think you also asked, didn't you, as to whether you think that, or whether we think that over-egging is not the right sort of thing, but becoming a bit strident about it all. Was well, that I, part I, of your question? Partly in my mind, yes. Was it? Yes. Because I do, I do think that's a bit worrying, and I'm not talking about the Irving case at all for obvious reasons, but I think particularly in America, if I may say so, I hope I'm not upsetting anybody if I say this, but I do think it can be taken too far. I mean, we mustn't forget, but we must move on if that's not a contradiction. That's my view. I just have a couple of questions. How do you feel about the American Indian Association and the Indian Association of Indian I, f I feel that uh, it's very important for it to be remembered, but not enough publicity is given. Although, in the last few years, Britain has established a Holocaust memorial, uh, which we have every year, which is a great help. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, think, I think, yes, it does help, yeah. Well, as time goes on, uh, it's difficult to say, but uh, I imagine that uh, even now, I think uh, probably about 80% uh, of the people in Britain don't even know what happened, you know. But as time goes on, probably uh, generations to come, it will uh, go down even worse, yeah. <clears throat> Well, I just wondered, uh, what is your feeling now about the Jewish God, God, it seems to be God has blessed you in your life with your wife and your children with descendants. Do you have a faith in God or do you have any practice of Jewish faith now? Do I practice? Um, I uh, am actually a be believer in God and particularly in the creation of the world. It's such a lovely world, I think, that's been created. Having said that, I'm not a really a religious person. I belong to a liberal synagogue, but uh, I, I do think that the, the world was created by a god, yeah. I still feel that, yeah. Well, on that note, thank you so much, uh, Victor and Charles, for coming and speaking to us this evening. Both of the talks were very illuminating. And, uh, thank, you. thank you all for coming, and I hope you found it interesting.